Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, your listeners, and ours as well. Thanks to all of you, including John Atwood, Pat, Mike Cortez, and we've got two new patrons, Tommy and Michael. Welcome. On this episode of DTNS, who got the latest prize in physics? That answer may surprise you. Plus AI chatbots uh, po- chat in politics. What could go wrong? And Adobe wants to make sure you don't get caught in a deep fake. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, October 8th, 2024. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Well, we're happy to have you all with us. We've got a lot of stuff to get through. So let's start, as we always do, with the quick hits. 14 state attorneys general, led by officials in New York and California, have filed lawsuits against TikTok, accusing it of harming children's mental health. The coalition of 14 law enforcement officers alleges that TikTok violated state laws by falsely claiming that its service is safe for young people. The lawsuits were filed individually and focused partly on what the plaintiffs call addictive features, including 24-7 notifications and video audio play. The filings also center on dangerous TikTok challenges and the collection of data about users under 13 without parental consent. After 14 years, Red Dead Redemption is finally coming to the PC, giving gamers across the original game access to the original game after its 2010 release on PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. It came to the Nintendo Switch and PlayStation 4 in 2023, but without the major remaster many fans had hoped for. The PC port will let players who experience Red Dead Redemption 2 on the PC complete the full story. Publishing conglomerate Hearst has partnered with OpenAI to integrate content from its big magazines like Cosmopolitan and Esquire into OpenAI's products, including ChatGPT. The deal led OpenAI's 200 million users access Hearst's lifestyle and news content, over 20 magazine brands, and 40 newspapers. A judge in the Epic v. Google antitrust case has ruled that Google must give rival third-party app stores access to the full catalog of Google Play apps and distribute third-party stores as Epic requested. Epic successfully argued that Google had created such a substantial array of deals with developers, carriers, and device makers that it was nearly impossible for rival stores to spring up. Judge James Donato ordered the ruling to go into effect from November 1st, 2024 through November 1st, 2027. And just by the way, Google is appealing this. Uber announced it's integrating ChatGPT into its driver app to assist with questions about electric vehicles as its EV ride hailing business expands. So at its Go Get conference, the company announced that Uber Green will go fully electric in 40 U.S. cities and several international locations, including in France, Australia, and New Zealand. These changes reflect uh, Uber's growing focus on electric vehicles for both drivers and couriers alike. All right, Rob, let's talk about let's talk about uh, getting awards. So the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has awarded the 2024 Nobel Prize in Physics to researchers Joff Hinton and John Hopfield for their pioneering work on artificial neural networks dating back to the late 1970s and early 1980s. So the recognition comes at a time where AI is clearly a driver of the, you know, (laughs) industrial revolution. Some people call it the fourth industrial revolution. Hinton and Hopfield were honored specifically for their, quote, foundational discoveries and inventions, end quote, that have enabled the development of machine learning through artificial neural networks. All right. So here's my question. Is this physics? And um, I guess I I guess it is. I mean, this is this is sort of the new normal, right? Like, yeah. is an LLM physics? In, in a sense, isn't everything kind of physics? 
<laughs> everything breaks down to stuff moving at some point yeah. or other. So I, I think what makes this truly physics is the fact that the, the way these gentlemen were thinking about these neural networks back in the day were was very similar to the way that the actual brain works and the way that brain stores memory. And they've actually, you know, taken cues from that to develop what they've developed. So I think that that's why it gets into the physics realm. Um, this particular award reminded me that I don't think I knew that the Nobel award was not like the Academy Awards until I was probably in college or grad school, that it's not based off of what happened last year. It's based off of what happened in years previous. It just is important to the world today. So it's pretty interesting. It's something that these gentlemen who are still, they're still chugging along. They're still doing what they do, um, you know, in this realm today for, you know, some 40 plus years later that they're still doing it, but they're being, you know, um, they're being, you know, recognized for work that they did literally back in the seventies and eighties when we were all very, very young. You know, one of the, uh, you know, and I, I know the, um, the ongoing conversation is sort of like, you know, AI is, you know, good, but it isn't. And, you know, when is it good and when is it not good? And, um, you know, I made a joke with, uh, some friends this morning of like, I was like, Thanks, Hinton and Hopfield, because <laughs> now we have just like really weird deep fakes all the time, <laughs> so, you know, on the Internet. But but um, and, and yes, uh, this technology allows for uh, that kind of thing um, to happen more often. And we all have to be more vigilant about it. But but really, the the you know, the the fact that. We are in a world where five years ago, we did not talk about any of this stuff. I mean, maybe there were like whisperings about it in, uh, in a research community, but now everybody on earth is either using these tools for good or not for good. And, you know, this is the new normal. Uh, and, you know, for that reason... It's a it's a pretty scientific uh, discovery. It but. is. It's 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 really amazing if if you think about just Chat GPT and LLMs and that type of artificial intelligence is really new to the world. We weren't talking about this at the level that we're talking about it now. Two years ago, I mean, we're still right. not at the two year mark when Chat GPT three came out, and everybody's like, "Oh wow, this is different." Let me go learn how to be a prompt engineer. That's not even two years ago. So it is even more impressive the fact that these gentlemen were thinking about this kind of stuff not two years ago. They were thinking about it 42 years ago. I mean, they were thinking about this stuff in the late 70s. So it is, uh, you know, you know, I know some people are saying, well, is it is it really physics? And it's like, well, yeah, everything kind of is. Um, but I, I, I do really believe that because of the way. And it doesn't really matter what I believe, you know, the, the Swedish Academy, the Royal Academy, the Royal, the Royal Swedish Academy believes this, that the way that this they were thinking about how this actually maps the actual mind uh, is where the physics play comes in. But, uh, you know, it's one of those things to where I, I think that you have an absolute responsibility to think about how things are going to affect the world. Not so much as maybe weapon systems, um, you know, you know, do that we build. But yeah, you kind of now, especially anything that's AI, you kind of have to think about if I build this, how is it going to affect tomorrow? Um, right. Because people are going to be nefarious in almost anything that comes out uh, as quickly as the good stuff that comes from. 100%. Yeah, yeah. It, um, it, it, yes, we're uh, <laughs> the whole sort of like modern physics uh, has definitely uh, taken a taken a slight turn, taken a slight turn um, as of late. So let, let, let's let's use that as a segue and to see how some just crazy ways that that artificial intelligence could be used. A Virginia congressional candidate, Bentley Hensel, wants to debate the incumbent seat holder, Don Byer, so badly that he's created an AI chatbot to stand in for Byer in case he's a no show for an October 17th debate. Byer never agreed to. This will put an entirely different spin on empty chair debating. Instead of the performative nature of debating someone who's not there, the chatbot, in this case, Don Donbot, which is built on APIs from OpenAI and trained on Don Byer's official websites, press releases, and data from the Federal Election Commission, could actually answer questions 
based on data from which it was trained. So, Sarah, I think that this has to be looked at as a publicity stunt. Bentley Hensel himself acknowledges that the use of AI is in part a last ditch effort to bring some attention to an otherwise predictable campaign. Don Beyer won the seat with an overwhelming majority in 2022. And in 2024, his campaign contributions outpaced Hensel's by nearly 90 to 1, where he has 1.5 million being raised just in, in just under 17,000 um, you know, for Hensel. So my question is, is, is this what politics has come to? Or, you know, we're, we're now we, we've got to debate AI to determine whether or not we are a, a, you know, a good candidate for the people. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy to me. OK, so 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 Don Beyer uh, running away with us, probably Run, running away. I like guess it's, it's over. I think it was 77 percent you know, of the vote is what he got last time. So he, he's clearly the, fr the front runner here. Right. So we've got Ben Lee Hansel, who's like, you know what? I want to debate you. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, and uh, Bayer is sort of like, not worth my time. But, but this is sort of interesting. So, uh, a, you know, a, and a, a non-incumbent uh, politician trying to, you know, get momentum. And yes, publicity stunt for sure. But, but, but is there a way, is there a world where you do debate what that other politician with all the things that can be, that can be scraped out from the world? You know, all, all the information, you know, could potentially help you because you're not necessarily lying. You're, so, you're, 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 it, it, it's performative, it, right? But it's not necessarily bad information. So there's two ways to, to think about this if you were in a political race. One, you could use this, you, this trained chatbot of your opponent as a sparring partner for an actual debate. So <laughs> yeah. I could have say say Don Beyer actually did agree uh, to an actual one on one, you know, televised debate. Uh, Bentley could use this and say, like, you know what, I'm gonna train up on all the potential questions that I might be asked, and then I can have, you know, a run through. So I will not so I'll be super prepared. Um, the other the other aspect to look at this is from the opponent's side, which is to say, look, they are training their their Don bot on these particulars of my previous candidacy, but also my previous positions. I will need to have maybe a broader set or maybe a, a focus on different other areas that might not have it might not have been trade on uh so i could give give a different slightly different performance uh for an audience that's still don but not don trained not not the don bot um which i think you know ultimately this is just a tool that further a muddies the waters for everyone it's just it adds noise to to to, mm -hmm. to, to the whole thing and uh i think it could be a good training tool I don't know how effective it would be in changing people's voters. Yeah, lives. when it when it comes into like a debate, like so and so didn't come. Well, now I'll just like I mean, debate your AI. It's like, uh, okay. I mean, I mean, <laughs> debates debates have have a nom have a, have a questionable influence on voter intent, right? Because they've they've done studies before and after, and the one thing that uh, will uh, deet or, or at least sort of point the way direction in which a voter will vote uh, bef uh, after debate is how they thought about that candidate before the debate. In other words, the debate didn't really switch anything, even people who were on the fence. Um, so in that aspect, I don't think it would be that effective. What I think it will be is, uh, you know, either deep fakes, which I think as people become more aware of it, tend to be a little more immune to, uh, but really just kind of as a training, like let's give all the scenarios to the Don bot and then find all the way, all, all the ways our can campaign can outflank them because they haven't, you know, they haven't done a B or C using it for sparring during debate prep that absolutely 
could be something I could see happening. Um, it's not going to be exact because one of the things that a human is always going to be able to do is is express nuance or right there on the fly change an opinion and make it sound like it's an opinion they've always held. That's that's one of the things that politicians are fairly adept at doing. They will tell you something today that's completely contrary to what they said a day ago, but make you think that what they said a day ago is exactly what they just told you just now. Yeah, and the AI and maybe because isn't going they to do said that. that is because you know they're responding to somebody attacking them right and it's they're going to say well you, you have to look at the nuance you know what were the things that were said before this the other part is that we don't believe politicians when they are standing there talking to us with the words coming out of their mouth so are we going to believe an approximation of what an ai thinks a politician would say no we're going to even be more skeptical so uh, you know like i said hansel even said himself that this is more or less a publicity blunt or publicity stunt, but it, it is interesting that right. you, you know, that we, we're in a space now where you can go look at everything that has been recorded, everything that has been written, right. everything has been put on video and push that into a computer and then ask it questions. And it tell you as though you were the person that was being recorded, that was, you know, that, that had their words, uh, you know, taken in whatever way they were taking and put into a computer and crunched out that that is an impressive thing. And it's, it's also the, the three attorneys in Virginia said that this would stand up to a legal test. There's really nothing that a uh, buyer would be able to do unless they were right. actively trying to mislead people um, or actively lying and saying that he said things that he didn't say. So I, well, and, th this is the thing. As Don Byer, I could easily say, putting words in my mouth. I didn't agree to that. That chat bot was trained on my history. But you know what? You could have a candidate go through all of my previous campaigning and do the same thing and still come up with hallucinations. So in other words, I don't know, again, I don't think there's an effectiveness to this. What I, what I will say, and I said this uh, in our pre-show meeting, is that I think politics is a good stress test for any kind of AI modeling or any kind of AI legislation because it does try to find all the, uh, all the legal, or not maybe legal, but all all the all, all the tricks you can do in order to kind of coax certain behaviors out of these technologies that you want. So if you have feedback about anything that gets brought up on the show, get in touch with DTNS audience on the socials at DTNS show on X or Twitter on Mastodon at MSTDN.social at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok and at DTNS Picks on Instagram and threads. Adobe is proposing a new way to protect digital artists from AI-driven deepfakes and content theft. The Content Authenticity Web App, launching in Q1 of 2025, will offer creators uh, an opportunity to apply content credentials to their work, certifying it as their own. If I made that, if I made that <laughs> that that piece of art, that is my piece of art. Adobe system uses digital fingerprinting, invisible watermarking, and cryptographically signed metadata to more securely protect an artwork, including images, video, and even audio files. Content authenticity adoption is voluntary, but Adobe has founded two industry groups to bolster trust and transparency, to which more than 90% of the camera industry belongs. Okay, so so this is Adobe. Um, Adobe is, uh, it, you know, what, um, what Adobe tries to do um, in an effort to make uh, you know, people who use Adobe products be like the most authentic people makes a lot of sense to me. But um, do we think that um, that this could be something that would be industry wide? Possibly. Um, because here's what Adobe is trying to do. Adobe is trying to make content authenticity. They're trying to make that be the new alt tag to where everybody just kind of uses it. So what they want is that if you've created a piece of digital artwork, you can sign it with this content authenticity web app or do it. I would imagine that eventually you'll be able to do it directly within Adobe apps. And once you sign it, this is how we're going to track to make sure that in, anyone who knows uh, you know, or who, you know, who looks at it is, is going to be able to eventually figure out who was the original creator. And that's what Adobe is trying to do. Now, as, as you said, Sarah, it is, 
is voluntary. But the fact that most of the camera manufacturers are using it and the fact that you're going to have other companies and platforms like Microsoft and OpenAI are going to be using it. Um, and then you've got the social media platforms like TikTok, LinkedIn, Google, Instagram, Facebook. They've all said that they're going to use it. Uh, and the fact that there's 33 million paying subscribers of Adobe products. I would imagine that this has a fair chance of catching on simply because people who are creating, you know, um, digital art, they want to make sure that they get credit for the things that they create. And this is a way that legitimately looks like it's going to be able to allow them to track and tell who created something originally. And I think it's, it's important, you know, on the, on the, uh, on the reverse of that, Rob, it's not just like, hey, I don't want you to st steal my work and then present it as your own. It's also making sure that people don't do something in, say, a very Rob Dunwood style, whether it's a picture or, or a photograph or whatever, and then altering it to make it seem maybe a little more unseemly. Like Rob something. did something that mm -hmm. he didn't do. Yeah, and and then presenting yeah. as like, look, Rob, Rob Dunwood, all he trades in is, you know, you know, uh, Look at those, uh, yeah. and, 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 you know, <laughs> you, and under he's the words, crazy shoes, Rob's yeah. like, I yeah. don't have those shoes, you know, like presenting you in a bad light. <laughs> and you want to say like, all my work is, is always, you know, in the same way that people used to fake emails, like it, it came from your mother or your father, uh, in this way, well, they still you, do that. Yeah. Well, but we've gotten wise to it, right? We understand we have, th we have clues that, that let us know. And the idea behind this for Adobe is that artists will be able to kind of have a chain uh, that no matter what alterations, there is a kind of a chain between, you know, my stuff and, and whatever someone else does that alters it. Um, and just as and this is just as important for Adobe. I mean, Adobe's one of Adobe's uh, Creative Cloud products is an AI generative tool, not only in Photoshop and Premiere, but also Firefly with standalone. And so the idea behind this is if Adobe can help establish the foundations of how mm -hmm. all this authenticity, uh, 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 the watermarking works, they actually have a lot of control going down the line because then all the other companies that try to build similar products will have to kind of adhere to that standard because that's what everyone else is using. And if you don't, then people aren't going to use your products because you don't support that particular I, uh, I, watermarking. I program. hope that's the case. I wonder if it is, though. You know, back in the day, it was sort of like, ooh, if you use Photoshop, like you're like a real photographer, you know, you're a real content creator, you know, that kind of thing. We are not in that world anymore. I mean, certainly if you're a, a Photoshop whiz, uh, you know, don't come for me <laughs> because you're really, really good at what you do. But there are so many other tools um, that, that um, I, I think it, it just, it obfuscates like what... What is real? What is not real? You know, who is really, really trying to do good things? And that's the conversation that we're having right now. Yeah, the, 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 the advantage that Adobe has is that so many people use their tools that they're, you know, PSD files are kind of the default yeah. now. It's like you're they're, using their file extension. So um, right here. So like right now, a tool that competes with Adobe Premiere is TikTok's uh, CapCut. Well, TikTok is already saying yeah. we're going yeah. to uh, support this. Now, they haven't signed on and saying that we're going to build this into our product. But the fact that if they're going to be supportive of it, you're probably going to be able to use CapCut and sign it so that it has content authenticity. So that if you know, so you can say this is a video that I created uh, and it's going to have all of those things that that market digitally so that people know that it's yours. So I just think, once again, it, this is, you know, what, what Adobe is trying to do here is they're trying to make content authenticity be the alt tag. Not everybody uses them, but enough people do. And there's so much benefit to using them that you actually doing yourself benefit if you're putting alt tags on your images so that people know where they're from, that people who maybe have who are visually impaired can actually see, you know, understand what your image is if they can't see it. Those kind of things are going to be beneficial to, you know, people. And I think that here, just knowing who actually created something or being able to say, hey, that's my image that somebody actually tried to to rip off from me, it's, 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 such, it's such a beneficial thing that I, I don't know that it's going to catch on, but it has the opportunity to. I think that Google or that Adobe rather is big enough that this could actually work for them. I I, mean, I feel like if anybody does this right, it's going to be Adobe. And, you know, yeah. I, it, who knows? Uh, you know, and, maybe I'm wrong. But, you know, we 
we do have to have some sort of fingerprint, you know, some sort, some sort of thing, you know, to, you know, let folks know, all right, yeah, this is legitimate. Um, here's who made it. Yeah. Here's why it's legitimate. And, and again, don't forget the, the sta- industry standards are an important thing for, for a very important reason. They're very long lasting, right? We still use docs. We still use a bunch of other file formats yeah. because they're legacy formats that billions of other people have used. And that's the only way to transmit information. And so, you know, again, you know, Adobe, if, if, if they can get enough people on board, it does give them a lot of weight in an industry that is now becoming very competitive. Also, I think it goes some way to alleviate the fear as Adobe integrates more generative AI tools into its uh, offerings that are starting to say, well, I'm never touching Adobe again because they're using generative AI. Yeah. yeah that's, that's a real new point. All right. Well, let's move on to our mailbag. Devin wrote in regarding yesterday's conversation that uh, Tom had with Nika Monford about direct-to-sell satellite connections from North Carolina, which has obviously been hit by a very terrible storm recently. Devin says, I live in Asheville, North Carolina, the epicenter of the devastation from Hurricane Helene. I'm safe but I don't have power. I'm off one of one of the main roads. The majority of residents don't have water and likely won't have for weeks, if not months. Devin says, I always thought the cell phone was my backup, but now I realize it's less of a redundancy than I thought. Many have actually resorted to AM FM radio as their primary source of information. Even today. Many in tech know the rule of threes for backing up files. I will now subscribe to the rule of three for internet connectivity. The first is your primary provider at home. The second is cellular. The third is some form of satellite, like Starlink, with a generator and at least five gallons of gas to power it. Devin says, I would strongly encourage each of your listeners to have a plan for staying connected if the unexpected happens. Being prepared can make a significant difference difference in a crisis situation, potentially saving lives. Yeah, this is it's it's pretty interesting, and I think we're going to talk a little bit more about it in GDI, uh, you know, after the show. But uh, yeah, it's you hate to say that you now have to have a Starlink and a generator, but you might now need to have a Starlink and a generator if you want to stay in contact with all these weather events that we seem to be having. And uh, with so much of us invested, with so much of our lives integrated with technology it's no longer a nice to have it's it's a crucial it's a part need of to have your plan yeah no it's 100 percent. so folks we also have a submission from chris christensen the amateur travel he sent us his thoughts on the dna theft from yesterday's dtns conversation about the impact on from 23 and me's data breach last year this is chris christensen from amateur traveler with another tech and sci-fi moment say what wanted to respond to Tom. You're talking about what's the worst that could happen if someone steals your genetic material. Well, sci-fi has taught us, of course, cloning, but that brings us to quick cloning, where you can download your consciousness into a clone for a temporary period of time. So, for instance, you could travel someplace without the jet lag or even do space travel instantaneously, having your consciousness beamed and then downloaded into a clone. So it could be that the worst thing that could happen is some really, really bad FOMO where your clone got to go to the moon base and all you got was this lousy t-shirt. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, Chris. Yeah, I know. I mean, gosh, imagine the clone just like doing all the cool stuff, going to the The, moon. The cooler thing is that Mr. Christensen says that with an absolutely straight voice. He really does. He really does. He's just like, "Mm, you you don't know that he's joking right there. Yeah. (laughs) Well, listen, uh, folks, um, as we wrap up the show, just a reminder that Apple Vision Show is a show hosted by myself and Eileen Rivera, and it is a lot of fun. We are wondering if we're getting M4 Mac Minis. Could be any day now. We're hoping so. Get subscribed now to uh, go along with the ride with us at applevisionshow.com. Also, patrons, stick around for our extended show here, Good Day Internet. We're going to talk and continue our conversation about being prepared for tech when you're in a natural disaster. It can be a little tricky depending on the types of conditions you'll be facing, but we're going to talk about it. 
You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 hundred UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com forward slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>